So, coming back to the uh, properties of the bone, uh, in the last module I have uh, discussed that um, how to define uh, the fracture related properties particularly the fracture toughness that is that uh, uh, critical stress intensity factor under mode 1 loading. So, this module will discuss some of the properties and uh, will 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 try to understand that how the bone properties depend on the mineral content or bone properties can vary from patient to patient. So, <coughs> this particular slide essentially plots the fracture toughness values of the human cortical bone human cortical bone measured using <coughs> measured using single edge notch beam uh, technique. And what you notice here is that this along x axis the age of different patients from which this uh, uh, cadaver bones were taken and then they were they, they, then they measure the fracture toughness are plotted. So, there has been a general trend that uh, higher the age of a patient there is a general decrease. So, there is a decrease in the fracture toughness with increase in age. That means, uh, patient uh, older patients the, the bones in older patients will have more proneness towards the fracture or, patient, or the older patients will be more prone to bone related fracture than the younger patients. The other thing that what you notice is that window over which this fracture toughness of that human cortical bone that they vary and this window is somewhere 4 to 7 MPa square root meter. So, this is the window across which this cortical bone uh, fracture toughness is. So, if any material uh, which you need to uh, use that is a bone replacement materials, if they are fracture toughness somehow can be within this particular window 4 to 7 MP square root meter. Although larger is the fracture toughness better it is. However, 4 to 7 MP square root meter that is the typical cortical bone fracture toughness and that is what one has to match with that kind of natural bone. You know, in terms of bone density <coughs> as I mentioned earlier that calcium phosphate content in natural bone decides the bone density. So, larger the bone density means that this bone is much more healthy and adult bone. Lower the bone density means the bone has much lower calcium phosphate content or hydroxyapatite content and typically this lower bone density is observed with older patients. Again there is a very linear trend with increase in the relative density of the bone uh, that maximum fracture toughness also increases it is a log scale 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 10. So, therefore, it must be somewhere between uh, 4 or 5 to uh, uh, more than. Uh, so, so, this is that typically that cancellous bone structure. So, cancellous bone is much weaker. So, cortical bone has a fracture toughness between 4 and 7. Here, cancellous bone has a fracture toughness between 0 0.1 to 1 MPa square root meter. So, essentially the cortical bone uh, sorry cancerous bone has extremely weak um, in as far as the mechanical property is concerned and therefore, it has a extremely low fracture toughness. So, it is extremely fragile to extremely fragile as far as the uh, mechanical loading is concerned. So, these two bone cortical bone and cancellous bone they have a widely different fracture resistance properties in terms of the fracture toughness and also they show uh, bone mineral density dependent uh, fracture resistance properties. And in both the cases you can see in the cortical bone also that K c increases as the bone mineral density uh, increases, um, bone mineral density increases. So, because if you look at the age in the uh, going to the right hand side if you plot the bone mineral density that should go on the left hand side. So, larger is the bone mineral density more is the fracture toughness and here again you can see that more is the bone mineral density more is the fracture toughness this is also true for cancellous bone. However, the uh, magnitude of increase or the, uh, the absolute toughness values of cancellous bone 
is much less than that of the cortical bone and that is due to their inherent porosity that is contained within the cancellous bone structure. Okay. <clears throat> now, let us understand little bit on the uh, bone mechanical properties or what I have mentioned earlier that structure property correlation. So, therefore, let me recall the structure of the bone at different length scale and if you look at this different length scale, typically the length scale increases along the arrow. So, at the very lower lowest level of the structural description, let us start from uh, right hand most of the uh, structural description. So, you have this collagen bundle. So, this is the red block collagen bundle. So, and this collagen bundle are there are some sidewise interaction is also uh, shown here. So, the sidewise interaction is essentially by weaker hydrogen bonding or van der Waals type of bonding. So, therefore, at any given stress conditions if necessary this collagen bundle can slide over one over each other. So, the sliding of the collagen bundle it is possible and that will that leads to certain element of deformation in the bone structure. So, this is at the mineral particle uh, level, this is the 2 to 4 nanometer level, this is the description. But then individual this collagen bundles, then in the fibrillar level, these are like several this number, several of these um, collagen fibrils are present. Again, between these fibrils, again you have this kind of weaker bond structure. And then if you go to the tissue level description, then this, this is that small regions of the tissue which are like magnified here and this is small uh, level of fibrillar um, description that is being magnified here. So, now when you are applying that external stress sigma, then what will happen? Uh, the shear stress that will be generated along the bundle uh, circumference and that is what is being mentioned in the next slides. So, before that let me also uh, underline some of the important concept. So, you have a mineral phase that is the calcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite in this bone. So, when you put them uh, when this uh, assembly of the collagen as well as hydroxyapatite nanoplatelets are placed under tension, then what will happen calcium phosphate phase will be placed under tension by shearing stresses and that will be transmitted through softer elastically softer collagen matrix. And if you see that what is the typical difference in that elastic modulus values, elastic modulus of collagen is 1 to 2 giga Pascal which is like order of magnitude less than the elastic modulus of the uh, hydroxyapatite as such. So, hydroxyapatite elastic modulus 110 giga Pascal collagen elastic modulus is 1 to 2 giga Pascal. So, because of this large mismatch is the elastic properties, it is quite uh, mechanically it is quite feasible that hydroxyapatite will be loaded in tension and collagen will experience more like a uh, uh, shear stress uh, under mechanical loading. So, there are two type of scenarios that are shown here. Scenario number 1 is that when hydroxyapatite or calcium phosphate phases, they are kind of present between the two collagen bundle here. So, this is one collagen bundle and this is a second collagen bundle. So, what is been shown here that this uh, collagen bundle here, they will experience some kind of shear stress here and this shear stress. Um, and so, that uh, that presence of the shear will make this collagen bundle to slide over each other, uh, slide over that hydroxyapatite platelets. These hydroxyapatite platelets although they will experience more like a tensile stress as I explained in the last slide. The another uh, scenario is that you have the collagen bundle and this collagen bundle within this collagen bundle you have the hydroxyapatite platelets here which are contained well within the collagen bundle and this collagen and the hydroxyapatite loaded collagen bundle 
when they will be uh, experiencing the global tensile stress. So, there will be automatically there will be sliding interfacial sliding uh, which will allow this uh, collagen bundle 1 to slide over the collagen bundle 2. And therefore, this will have a very constant fibrillar strain which will be experienced by the hydroxyapatite which are contained within this um, collagen bundle. So, therefore, a deformation at the ultrastructural level can be described by the two events as I explained to you in the last slide that is one is the frictional sliding between the extra fibrillar mineral platelets and elongation of the less mineralized collagen fibrils and second one is the mineralized collagen fibrils past each other. So, damage essentially of the bone structure corresponds to the breakage of the sacrificial bonds. So, sacrificial bonds means these are the kind of sacrificial bonds I have mentioned here. So, these are like sacrificial bonds. So, this is the breakage of the sacrificial bonds and restructuring of the material under load. Okay. So, damage uh, again this, uh, this damage. Uh, so, this uh, breakage of the bonds has been explained here in more specific terms that is you have the non collagenous proteins and extra fibrillar mineral between the fibrils and between collagen and mineral within a fibril and restructuring of the material under load. And also there is localized clusters of such breakage and that can lead to uh, that can grow and link up as in conventional fiber matrix uh, fiber uh, fiber reinforced composite materials. So, in a way from the basic description of the different uh, scale of this bone structure, uh, it should be apparent to you that natural bone can behave more like a fiber reinforced composite which is the fiber component here. So, this fiber is your collagen and what is the reinforcement here and reinforcement is essentially hydroxyapatite or the mineral phase. So, any fiber reinforced composites in that conventional material science you know that it shows much better mechanical properties compared to individual constituent. So, if you extend that similar kind of idea here in describing the bone properties, it should be clear to you that because that collagen fibers are dispersed in this bone structure and this hydroxyapatite platelets are equally present there. So, hydroxyapatite platelets presence of hydroxyapatite is essentially reinforce the elastic properties of this bone structure. So, I hope that I have covered both these uh, bone structure and their properties and to some extent how these fracture properties can be measured experimentally. Now, we will start with this uh, some of the key concepts of the biomaterials um, and essentially the definitions and certain discussion of some of the concepts. So, the aspects of the biomaterial science essentially deals or essentially integrates the concepts of the two widely or two remotely linked disciplines. One is that biome is biological sciences and materials being material sciences. So, these two uh, these two disciplines they are integrated and their ideas and their concepts are being drawn together to build up this discipline of these biomaterials. So, this is like more formal definition of these biomaterials. So, any material natural or synthetic constituting the whole or part of a living structure um, which performs enhances or replaces the natural function of a natural function of a tissue uh, without evoking any undesired toxic reactions can be called as biomaterial. So, there are certain things that has been that needs to be underlined here. So, one is the non toxic second one is a non immunogenic, immunogenic, third one is non thrombogenic, fourth one is a non carcinogenic and non irritant material. So, therefore, one has to assess each of these properties like how one can uh, one can um, quantify or assess the non toxic properties or non immunogenic, immunogenic properties of a synthetically fabricated or synthetically produced material. 
The second definition which is much more recent and this is given by David Williams and uh, which states that a material which is engineered to take a form which alone are a part of a complex system like a drug delivery system by is used to direct by control of interactions with components of living systems like living systems means cells, proteins, uh, bacteria, blood etcetera the course of any therapeutic or diagnostic procedure in human or veterinary medicine. So, one of the core property of bio biomaterials which has been briefly mentioned before also that is the biocompatibility and this is again a textbook type of definition. So, which essentially states that uh, it is the ability of a material to perform its desired function with respect to a medical therapy um, without eliciting any systemic effects or local effects in the recipient or beneficiary of that therapy that is human patient but generating the most appropriate beneficial cellular or tissue response. Most beneficial cellular or tissue response that means this is application specific biocompatibility property. So, in other words biocompatibility definition wise is more application specific. The end point objective is that that material that uh, biocompatibility property uh, should uh, <coughs> enable clinically relevant performance of that uh, targeted therapy. So, this is a targeted application specific and it should involve both in vitro as well as in vivo experiments. In vitro means some the experiments which are conducted in the lab with glassware or petri dishes in vivo means experiments were conducted using animal models. So, in vitro the Latin word means test tube, culture disc or, or glass and <coughs> it is an artificial environment outside a living organism such as a test tubes. Essentially, you are simulating the living system in a test tube or in a uh, glassware and these are the scientific experiments which are essentially performed with cells or biological molecules like proteins and so on in physiologically simulated environment but outside the normal biological context. So, therefore, since these are the experiments which are conducted, conducted outside the normal biological context, it cannot although it wanted to simulate that exact environment which is present in a uh, in any animal or human patient. However, it is the first uh, study maybe it is the first set of experiments which are to be conducted before one can go for the in vivo experiments which are again defined here as the experiments conducted inside living organisms to simulate physiologically and functionally similar micro environment around a biomaterial in relation to its targeted application. So, therefore, whenever you one has to do this in vivo experiments there you have to have a different kind of defect model or different kind of animal model to simulate the in vivo environment uh, to simulate the in vivo experiments. Now, specific animal model the rationale of choosing specific animal models is also disease specific. For example, rabbit models are used more for conducting bone replacement materials while sheep model are used more for cardiovascular implants. So, therefore, for cardiovascular implants one is to use much larger sized animals like sheep or pig model. Okay. <coughs> the, this uh, third one is that host response or foreign body response. So, it is the reaction of a living system to the presence of a foreign material in vivo. So, to start with one has to remember that whenever you implant any biomaterial in a living system it always causes it always cause some kind of local or systemic inflammatory response. And this response in scientifically is known as the host response and it occurs irrespective of the way that you implant the material like either uh, through surgery or through injection as all biomaterials are expected to cause a disruption in the local tissue environment. Cytocompatibility also has been mentioned before that is it is cell level compatibility. So, essentially ability of a biomaterials to be in contact with proliferating cells without pro producing an adverse toxic response. 
and this toxicity is quantified using a uh, uh, using different assays. Most popular assays that people use is MTT assay and a complementary assay also one can use this LDH assay. Now, each assay one of the things that in cell biology uh, one has to remember that each assay actually gives you certain specific information. One cannot make any uh, overstretching statement based on the results of one single assay. For example, MTT assay tells you the number of metabolically active cells. So, if that x percentage cells are metabolically active in a given cell population, one cannot say that 100 minus x percent cells are dead simply because for in order to quantify the dead cells one has to use that LDH assay. So, this LDH assay when you do LDH assay then only you can say yes y percentage of the cells in a given cell population is dead, it is not uh, alive anymore, x plus y can be 100 or may not be 100 or less than 100. So, in cell biology one cannot kind of make overstretching statement based on the information obtained from a single assay. Hemocompatibility, the hemo means blood, uh, hemocompatibility essentially means that blood level compatibility and it is a study of a compatibility of a synthetic material with blood and blood cells. Now, this level compatibility is important for cardiovascular materials like cardiovascular stents, pacemakers, cardiac patches and so on and it depends on the different factors like hematology a study of red and white blood cells and coagulation that is a platelet adhesion and leukocyte adhesion and fibrinogen adsorption. So, which also takes place on artificial material. Ideally and hemocompatible a perfect hemocompatible material should not cause any platelet adhesion and should be non thrombogenic in nature. In other words it does not disturb the delicate hemolytic balance between the coagulation and fibrinolysis. Okay. <coughs> now, having given this all these different definitions there are two things uh, often people are uh, confused in this uh, biomedical applications or as far as the biomedical materials are concerned. One is called scaffold and another is called imp implant. Now, these two things need to be defined uh, with respect to their distinct uh, uh, with respect to their characteristics which distinguish themselves. Uh, scaffold normally means that is a porous material and this uh, porosity is very helpful for the cell colonization and cell growth and proliferation and also to many extent to some extent cell differentiation. So, these scaffold structures are essentially three dimensional synthetic porous structure as has been mentioned very clearly in the first line itself to facilitate tissue formation in vitro. And this kind of uh, interconnected porous structure which is present in many of the scaffolds which are experimentally studied in different research groups around the world. This interconnected porous structures are helpful for the um, osseointegration integration property like when you implant this scaffold structure in any animal model that also helps in the uh, helps in angiogenesis like blood vessel formation through this porous structure that also helps in the bone ingrowth into the porous structure. Now, those things will uh, will describe it much more later, but at this point uh, you must uh, understand that scaffolds usually sharp most of the A, B, C, D properties or at least few of these properties. Uh, these allow cell attachment and migration. Now, what is cell migration? I have explained to you before that is essentially motility on a material substrate, deliver and retain cells and biochemical factors, enable diffusion of vital nutrients and expressed products and exert certain biological and mechanical influences to modify cell behavior. Now, typically the scaffold term implies porous constructs with interconnected pores more in like 10 to 100 micrometer which facilitates, which facilitates tissue in growth reduce limitations due to diffusion of nutrients and so on. 
So, the morphology and porosity are the primary importance in scaffold whereas, mechanical properties are of secondary importance. As I said since it is a synthetic porous structure three dimensional porous structure this cancellous bone you remember that cancellous bone also has a very large porous structure and cancellous bone are mechanically inferior than cortical bone. Similarly, since scaffolds are essentially three dimensional porous structure scaffolds also have weaker mechanical properties. And these scaffolds are important in tissue engineering before, uh, before uh, defining other terms. Uh, let me also explain that what is meant by implant. Implant is a general term used to describe any object that may be placed in direct contact with living tissues. That FDA that is US body that is food and drug administration defines medical implants as devices or tissues that are placed inside or on the surface of the body. So, it is used many implants are prosthetics and this is intended to replace missing body parts and other implants deliver medication or monitor body function those things we are not that does not come under the purview of this present course. However, uh, these implants <coughs> by definition as you see that these are like medical devices which are placed in direct contact with living tissues. Uh, examples of the implants is THR like total hip joint replacement. You have a stem that is made of either titanium or stainless steel that is the stem. You have a femoral head that is either made of the steel or alumina and you have acetabular socket again that is made up of that uh, uh, polymeric materials like ultramarine polyethylene. Now, all these three materials essentially at the bulk level they are not three dimensional porous structures which a scaffold is, but that is this THR which is a very a well known example of an implant. It is essentially a three dimensional solid structure non porous structure which is intended to carry lot of mechanical loads as well as it is intended uh, to function under a large number of fatigue cycles during that mechanical loading conditions. So, therefore, implants are by definition meant for more like mechanical load bearing applications. Another examples of the implant is total knee replacement. So, total knee replacement also uh, uh, has load bearing materials. So, this load bearing materials are essentially non porous and solid materials like total hip replacement materials. So, certainly the implants must have much better mechanical properties than scaffolds, but with uncompromised biocompatibility properties. Why implants are necessarily to have or it is meant to uh, they are meant to have better combination of mechanical properties with uncompromised biocompatibility properties because biocompatibility properties that is the bottom line for a performance of any biomedical applications and therefore, uh, we need to understand that what is the distinction between the scaffold and implant and I hope that in last two slides I have made such distinctions little clear in your overall understanding.